understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. What a fantastic chapter we've got before us today, the 13th chapter of Ezekiel. Ezekiel in the Hebrew tongue meaning God strengthens us. If you want real strength, strength that will stay with you from the Word of God, that's where it comes. This 13th chapter is written to both male and female. That's prophets and prophetists. That's men preachers and women preachers. And it's basically headed at fakes, okay, false doctrines. And our father comes down on them pretty good. As a matter of fact, he knocks the rapture doctrine totally out of the park whereby if anyone believed in it after covering this chapter, they'd been a heap, they would be in a heap of hurt because God is against it. You don't want to go somewhere that God is against because uh, basically most people that go against God end up in hell. Not a good place to be. Chapter 13, the great book of Ezekiel, verse 1, and it reads, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Straight from our Father now, Son of man, prophesy against, and I want to repeat that, not for, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, that's their own minds, hear ye the word of the Lord. In other words, when, when you don't hear it from God, you better keep your mouth shut as far as repeating what God might have to say. That's a dangerous thing. That's why judgment begins at the pulpit. Verse 3, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. In other words, not the Holy Spirit. They don't follow the Holy Spirit nor even seek it. It's their own spirit. Ego trips. Got their own little ministries. Only the Father has the ministry. Everyone else is an under-shepherd. Verse 4, O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the desert. Now, that would lose you if you weren't familiar with the greatest love story ever told, the Psalms of Solomon. Chapter 2, verse 15. It has to do with Israel being the vineyard, and Christ is the vine, and when those vines begin to have those tender little blossoms on them, then the little foxes, which are the Kenites, the sons of Cain, run amongst the vines and knock off the little flowering um, buds whereby there is no fruit. He said, that's what false prophets do. That's what fake teachers do to you. They knock off the little blossom where you're never going to have any fruit from God. And naturally, uh, in that great uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15, canicles in some of your Bibles is the name of the book, then um, meaning the same thing, then certainly um, you have the reason that the influx of Kenites destroys. It bleeds off into false preachers. Verse 5, ye have not gone up into the gaps neither made up the hedge of the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Now, this lets you have a time sequence here as to when this is really addressing. The day of the Lord is when? Well, how long is a day with the Lord? It's a thousand years. Well, what's a thousand years? It's the millennium, and the millennium is coming. That's the great change at the second advent. He said, you, you haven't, you know, Israel is supposed to have a wall around her. It's a hedge, usually a thorn hedge as it goes around. You haven't, you've got these holes where the foxes and other infiltrators, false teachers, preachers, they got holes in the wall and you let them in. You don't cull them out. You don't get rid of them. You don't, you allow them in and here we have this great battle of the Lord's day coming before us meaning Antichrist is coming to deceive this world. 
But as you'll learn here, he'll say, all you can do is teach them to fly to save their souls, and I am the Savior. That's what he means. Our father's not a happy camper with false preachers. Verse 6. They have seen vanity. That means hot air, emptiness, vanity, nothing. And lying divination. That means lying about something that's supposed to be divine. Saying, the Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Poor people go to church and they expect to be taught God's word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, whereby they know what Almighty God has to say. And you get some false prophet that'll only read one verse and then pop hot divine air for an hour. What, what good is that? God didn't send them and God doesn't like it. You're on God's time spreading lies. Can anybody imagine how that could possibly make God happy? It doesn't. It angers him. Verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 7 to continue. Have you not seen a vain vision? I didn't send it. You're lying to yourself. That's what he's saying. And have you not spoken a lying divination? Whereas you say, the Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. You know, you have these ministers that say, oh, I talked to the Lord today. Oh, did you? Let me tell you something. When the Lord speaks to you, you won't be probably sharing it with anyone right away. You'll do what he says that you should do. And you will be very humble about it. Well, he told me where to park my car. Let me tell you something. If you're too stupid to know where to park your car, God's not going to help you. God doesn't like wimps, poor me babies. He likes men and women that have a spirit and a soul that is akin to the Holy Spirit and gets it done. Verse 8. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God. This is how it's going to be. Because ye have spoken vanity, hot air, and seen lies, claiming, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. You know, if the Father is against you, you're in a heap of hurt. You have drifted away from the truth, and you're just seeing and listening to a bunch of lies, and you have no conception of truth or how to identify truth when it's so simple. Well, what do you mean, dear brother, what is so simple? The Word of God. That's why he wrote this letter to you, so that you wouldn't be taken in by these falsies, so you would know what God was against and what God was for. It's that simple. A child can um, understand that if they listen to the simplicity in which God brings forth his Word. Verse 9. And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity. Oh, I know who they are. And that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Oh, my goodness, wonder what he's going to do with them if they're not going to be in the house of Israel and they're not written in the book. I'll give you one guess. They're going to hell. Okay. That's real uh, simple to figure out. You know, if you're going against God and if you're harming the children he loves because God is a God of love, if you're causing hurt to them by trying to make a name for yourself or claim God said you to, something to you he didn't say, whereby you divine up something to get attention for yourself, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. Don't think God isn't keeping score. That's what he's talking about here. When it comes roll call, you're not going to be there. Judgment begins at the pulpit. Verse 10. Because, even because, this is why, 
they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace. And one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. In other words, they whitewashed it. Now, how do you think that's going to protect the people if you build a wall with untempered mortar? And what's going to happen, and, and, and put a little milk stain on it, a little whitewash, what do you think when the latter rain comes? It's going to wash it all away. And so it will wash away the false teachings of every prophet and every prophetess that lies a divine spoke, uh, a speaker, supposedly, and their divinity stops way short of arising to the occasion of the Holy Spirit, but their own spirit. God is not happy with them. I would certainly hate to be in their shoes. One way that any pastor can get away from that is rather than teaching traditions of men, teach the Word of God and be blessed. It's real simple. You can break away from it. When you daub something with untempered mortar, that old, and, and you lie to the people about it, it's not going to happen. It's peace, peace, peace. You, you, as a matter of fact, you don't have to worry about anything. Don't even study the book of Revelation because you're going to be gone. Gone to hell if you're not careful. That's what God is talking about here. Don't listen to their lies. Verse 11. Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar that it shall fall. Not maybe, not perhaps. Going down. <clears throat> there shall be an overflowing shower of truth. And ye, O great, and, and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall in a stormy wind. Spirit, ruach, shall rend it. God's going to make certain it falls. You can't build a false religion and traditions of men will go down the tube. Verse 12, Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, where is the daubing wherewith you have daubed it? In other words, where's your protection from the end times? A bunch of lies will not sustain you, sustain you against the, the false Christ when the Holy Spirit wants to speak through you, how can the Holy Spirit trust you if you hopped in the sack with the false Messiah, thinking he is Christ? He can't use you, my friend, because of the false teaching of the prophets, preachers, preacherettes. It's a sad, sad state of affairs to mislead the children of God. The wall of lies is coming down, 13 Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. That's a promise that's not going to stand. I'm going to do it in, do away with it. 14, so will I break down the wall that you have daubed with untempered mortar, and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation, the very lie from the bottom thereof shall be discovered, and it shall fall, and you shall be consumed in the midst thereof, and you shall know that I am the Lord. You don't mess around with our Heavenly Father. Our Father loves His children, but God can't stand a liar, especially if He sets Himself up as some preacher or a preacherette. He can he, he won't handle that. And it's, it's just as good as writing yourself a, a one-way ticket to hell with no return. You don't want to go there, my friend. You want to teach God's Word. What saith the Lord? You want to say what God would have you say, not what God is against. You, you know something? You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer to understand that. You don't have to be the brightest bulb in the box to know don't go against God. Verse 15, Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar 
and will say unto you, The wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. Whoa. Well, where did they go? I'll give you one guess. It shouldn't be too difficult. Judgment begins at the pulpit, and if they are lying diviners, they're out of here. Verse 16, listen carefully. To wit, the prophets of Israel which prophesy concerning Jerusalem and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord God. In other words, never before in history. Well, when can I believe there will be peace in Jerusalem? When the Prince of Peace comes. That's not difficult at all to understand. There's only one Prince of Peace. You know, he appeared in Jerusalem at one time. And guess what happened to him there? They crucified him. He's going to come again at the second advent. It's called the Lord's Day, the millennium. And you don't want to be in the same house with this group. I guarantee you, you would be so shocked and so disappointed They'll be taken in by the false Christ anyway because the false Christ says, I've come to rapture you out of here. And they're going to jump in his boat thinking it is Christ. Why? They haven't read God's word when he warns you over and over and over that the false Christ comes at the sixth trump and he doesn't return until the seventh. Child can understand that. Now this gets real serious now, so listen closely. 17, likewise thou son of man, Set thy face against, I want to repeat again, against the daughters of thy people. This is the prophetist, which prophesy out of their own heart and prophesy thou against them. I don't want you to be for them. I want you to be against them. Well, what are they doing? Which ones am I against? Well, he'll make it real clear for you. 18, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sow pillows, to all armholes, and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls, to do what? Figure out a way to salvation. Will you hunt the souls of my people, and will you save the souls alive that come unto you? Do you think man can do that? That's what God is saying. Now, listen to me carefully. Kasha. It's what this word uh, pillows is. And it means to cover the armhole. It means to cover every digit in my outreached fingers and hand of salvation to my children with your lies and your false teaching. You cover every knuckle of Almighty God's hands outreaching to save His children whereby they lose their way to salvation because the good daughters are going to tell you how to fly away and save your little old soul. Only it's not biblical. It's a lie. I know I'm just winning friends and influencing people here, but I teach God's Word, and I do not apologize for it because I do not want to be guilty of someone ending up with that one-way trip. Far better to teach what God's emotions are and how he does love his children. But he said, you, you, you worship these little statutes in high places where you, you worship what you shouldn't. But dear brother, you don't have to study God's word. You're going, you don't have to understand the book of Revelation. This is how they cover the knuckles of God. You're going to fly away. Even though God says Revelation means to unveil to make known. Anytime you would listen to a man that would tell you you didn't have to understand the book of Revelation over God, then you're doomed. You're in a heap of hurt when you would listen to man instead of Almighty God, your Father. He wrote this letter to you. And again, I'll say it. Whatever language you wish to translate the apocalypse, Revelation, it means to uncover or to make known, not to hide, as these false prophetess will cover up so and so and so with lies till there's a bed of them to cover every joint. And, and the, the Hebrew is so specific, every knuckle. 
in God's outreaching hand to save his children, it's hidden from the sight of the people. Well, just what do they do? Well, let's find out. Verse 19, and will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread, claiming you're a preacher taking a salary to slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies. Now, uh, people, I'm going to tell you something. It's real easy to avoid lies. All you have to do is read God's Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and you know right away if somebody's lying to you. What is God warning against here? Verse 20, Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against, and I want to emphasize, I want to say it emphatically, against your pillows, wherewith you there hunt the souls to make them fly, to rapture, and I will tear them from your arms and will let the souls go, even the souls that you hunt to make them fly. Now, God is so against that. And in the Hebrew, this is so simple, a child can understand it. But do you know that one of the most modern versions of the King James Bible that has recently come out, NIV, do you know what some little Kenite has done here? Instead of saying, hunt souls to make them fly, to make the little birds fly. Now, there is no way, as a student of the Hebrew manuscripts, that an intelligent person can translate souls to birds. It's for the birds, all right. They made a lie out of the very correction of God against the rapture doctrine. Why? Well, they, they didn't want to admit they were wrong. You know, it's a lot better to admit mistakes in the flesh where you can repent and still be heaven bound than it is to deceive God's children and go to hell. But then after all, it's your choice. You make it, you live with it. But what he's saying here, <clears throat> I'm against the pillows, the shock. I'm against the coverings and the lies that you cover my real outreaching arms that all you have to do is believe and you'll not perish. But we want to fly. Let me ask you a question. Where are you going to fly to? He's coming here. Where do you want to go? God loves his children, and he makes it very simple, <coughs> excuse me, as to where they will go. <clears throat> and who will survive and who will not. It's your choice. And that kasha, that covering, <clears throat> it is a web of lies that are put out for people and teachings of traditions of men that simply make void this word of God. And many people will say, well, would you throw the Bible away if, it, if they've changed that? Well, what would you do? The same Bible, if you go to Isaiah chapter 14, <clears throat> where it says, and it's speaking of the son of the morning, Lucifer, they drop out the word Lucifer. So a young person doesn't know who it's talking about, unless they're pretty sharp. Well, why wouldn't they know? Because they've changed it. That's why. Well, why would they change away from Lucifer? Because they follow him. They're his children. They love to tinker with God's word to deceive people. They are false prophets and false prophetess that spend a lifetime being higher critics that like to mess with the word of God. Well, are you judging people? No, I'm, I'm just telling you the truth, and I'm telling you how to prove it or disprove it real easy. All you have to do is compare it. All you have to do is take that word pillows back to the Hebrew <clears throat> and understand it. You with, you with companion Bibles, it's made real easy for you. Dr. Bullinger lays it out real simple for you, <clears throat> and it's easily understood. Verse 21. 
your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, and you shall know that I am the Lord. He's going to end it. Well, how will he do that? Second advent. <clears throat> He's coming back. He told you on the Lord's Day earlier in the chapter. Who do you listen to? Do you read God's Word or do you listen to man? You see, God is warning you against man and woman here that would teach falsely. And if you go to one of these places where they'll read one verse and then blow hot air or vanity for an hour, you may be in a heap of hurt because you're sure not learning what saith the Lord. And you're sure not understanding. You see, as it is written in Mark 13, Christ makes it very clear. Behold, I have foretold you all things. There should be no surprises to you. If he has foretold us all things, well, where did he tell us? Right here. Have you read it? Do you try to understand it? It's really quite simple. A child can understand this chapter. You can pick up pretty quick. Our father's not happy with false teachers, especially those that would say, all you, to save your soul, all you got to do is fly in the rapture doctrine. It's over. That's it. Boy, that's deep, isn't it? <clears throat> if you want to be saved, you will love your father and do as he says. You will stand. You will put on the gospel armor and stand not with Satan, but against the fiery darts of Satan, Ephesians chapter 6. And you will put on the girt that will hold your britches up. It's called the Word of God. And when you're familiar with the Word of God, you won't be losing your britches. That's putting it pretty plain, but that's what happens when you lose your girt. And the girt is the Word of God. It's your belt. So, uh, I don't know. Traditions of men make void the Word of God. And if you ever had a chapter that makes that any simpler, this is it. Let you know how man and woman teachers will mislead you. But it sounded so holy. If God didn't say it, it's not holy. It's devilish. If it isn't true, it's devilish. I don't care how goody-goody it might sound. You're dealing with souls, eternal life. That's a very serious subject. And God doesn't like people to hanky around with the souls of the children that he loves. Um, so, you know, uh, when people change things, and um, even down as God would say, you, you, um, you even hide the knuckles or the joints of my hand. His hands love us. He wants to protect us with them. And when somebody covers the real truth over of God's plan and his saving grace by lying, well, it sounded so precious. That doesn't cut it. Is it. Does it agree with God's word? Thus saith the Lord. Because God didn't send them if it doesn't, and you're hearing a lie. And that's dangerous. I am not saying this to frighten anyone, but a child knows what is wicked and what is right. It is wicked to listen to traditions that go against our loving Father. And so it is. Uh, God is going to deliver his people. You can try to put anything you want over his loving hands. He will rip it and tear it and, and cast it and save the people that love him. Do you or do you listen to the traditions of men that make void the word of God? It's your choice, it's your ship, you sail it. Don't go on the rocks. Verse 22 to continue. Because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, and it is sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked. You make it so easy for them that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. You don't have to study God's Word. You're going to be gone. Isn't that sad? It truly is. 
And you know something? There are people listening to my voice right now that have heard that over and over. I, I sometimes think the reason so-called preachers don't want to explain the book of Revelation is they don't understand it themselves. Therefore, why should they risk uh, their reputation by saying, I don't know? And it should never embarrass any pastor to be asked a question and for him to say, I don't know, let, but let's find out. Let's search it out. Let's dig in God's Word, because God's Word is complete. Our, our Father is not happy about this. And when you pick a church, and I'm not judging churches, but it isn't very difficult. You can walk in and listen five minutes and know whether you're going to hear the Word of God or a bunch of you-know-what. It's real simple. It's either the Word of God or it isn't. And quite frankly, why would you go to church somewhere when church is supposed to be God's house? And what is important, God's on the throne. It's going to happen the way he says it will, and the way it will go down the way he says it will. So why would you listen to man rather than God? It's that simple. Verse 23 to complete the chapter. Therefore, you shall see no more vanity nor divine divination, for I will deliver my people out of your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. He is able. I mean, it's no problem for him. And during the Lord's Day, which it mentioned earlier in this chapter, it's going to happen. God's elect will reign with Christ for a thousand years, as Revelation chapter 20, verse 5 stipulates. And a lot of correction will be done there. You might say, well, are you saying some people may have a second chance? Hey, if there's nothing but false preachers and prophetess, then they didn't have a chance coming out the gate, did they? I, I know that's sad, but uh, it is true. Our Father loves His children. And He gets a little direct sometimes. And do you know something? In this generation, especially, it's needed. Directness, honesty, and truth. Truth saves. Lies will send you to hell. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. Hey, spirit moves. You got a question? You share it. Lay it on us. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, um, denomination, or organization. Let's don't judge people. Our Father's the judge, and in like today's lecture, he's judging. He's making it clear enough that no one should, <clears throat> excuse me, miss the boat, so to speak. He was talking about those that are written in the book of life in the house of Israel. That's the house that Christ reigns over, and if you're in Christ, your name's there. But make sure that a bunch of lies and diviners do not rob you of that, because that's what their intentions are. They're kind of directed by Satan. Satan likes to deceive people. He's the greatest deceiver of all times. See that you don't fall into that trap. You that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. And it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Now, let's go to the Lord's table. You 
We can do away with the phone number. We can do away with the address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. He's our Father. He's the very creator of your being. And he knows and he loves you. Let's go to that throne, Heavenly Father. Around the world we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Vanessa from Pennsylvania. My question is about judgment and free will. If God already knows how everything will happen in our lives, why do we need judgment and how do we have free will? You know, uh, God doesn't know what you're going to choose. He knows what he's going to do. But he doesn't have the uh, faintest idea what some people are going to do. Why? Because he gives you a free will. Why? Because he loves you and he wants you to love him. Now, God cannot have true love from an individual without giving them total freedom. And he doesn't know what they're going to choose. If he forces them to choose, that's not real love. And God doesn't deal with false love or false anything. So the reason we have free will, uh, you might, you, you've left one uh, equation out of this is election. Because God chose some, as it's written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, before the foundations of this earth age, at Satan's first rebellion. Why? They stood against him. God knows he can trust them. He, he, he didn't pick them because they're the prettiest or his favorites. They earned it. So uh, God will intercede in their lives. He knows what they're going to do because he's going to see that they do it. And he may, he'll take the paddle occasionally and thump their little gourds if they don't get it done right. Why? He loves them. And, and, um, and our Father does that. But as far as free will is concerned and God knowing, if he knew exactly what somebody was going to choose, we would have skipped this earth age and went right into the third. But God is a God of love. And love can only generate within each entity or its fraud. You can't buy it, you can't order it, and, and you can't demand it and have it be real. It's, you've got to love him because he's your father and how good he is to us. That's what he wants. LG from California. Is it Bible prophecy that America will go into socialism before the deadly wound, or is that part of the deadly wound? America will never go into socialism. America will never go into communism. Well, how can you be so sure? Because I'm an American, and because I know my fellow citizens. We're a freeborn people, and don't ever, ever think for a minute some idiot can entrap freeborn people and make slaves out of them for communism or socialism. It won't fly. You either get out there and cut it or you stay wherever you want to. It's a free world. Well, I would just like to have a little more than I have. Then work. W-O-R-K. Work at it. Get it. Amount to something. Don't be a jerk and a no good. And now that, that may offend some people, but that's biblical. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. If somebody won't work, don't feed them. Period. Mark, and that doesn't have anything to do with handicapped people. We take care of our own. Mark from Arkansas, please explain Acts 2, 37, 41. Is this baptism right? Baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. What, what, what happens when you baptize someone in the name of Jesus Christ? What does Jesus Christ mean? Translate it for me. Jesus is Yeshua. Well, well, brother, now what is Yeshua? Yeshua is Yahweh's Savior. That's the Father and the Son. But who, who is Christos? Inter interpret it. Translate it. Christos is the anointed one, the all of our people. So you're saying the same thing. That's the Holy Spirit. Wherever the three are, there you have it. So 
the baptism is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Wherever the Father and the Son are, naturally the Holy Spirit is there because it's God's Spirit. William from Texas, where in the Bible does it say, spare the rod and spoil the child? Proverbs chapter 13, verse uh, 34. <clears throat> I'm sorry, verse 24. 13, 24 Proverbs. It goes something like this. If a father hates his child, he will spare the rod. Why? If you don't want them to go wrong, you want to correct them. Never correct a child when you're angry. And never, never correct a child without understand, they, explaining why you're doing it. Peggy from Georgia. Where in the Bible does it say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. To be absent from the flesh body is to be with the Lord in your spiritual body. And, and that's not the only place it's written. In, in 1 <coughs> Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 15, following verse 35, we have two bodies. You, you got to get that through your mind. Paul really wanted you to know that we have two bodies. We have a flesh body. But we also have a spiritual body. It doesn't get sick. It doesn't get old. It doesn't get wrinkled. It doesn't get diseased. That's your spirit body. This corruption puts on incorruption. Incorruption is that spiritual body. However, there's another part of this equation. That is your soul. Your soul, which is your intellect, which is really, I like to translate yourself, regardless of which body you're in, you're still going to have that soul that answers for itself. And that soul is mortal, meaning it's liable to die. It must put on immortality, which is deathlessness, meaning love the Lord and have eternal life. Okay? You've got two bodies, and to be absent from this flesh when you're in your other one. There are, God is the God of the living, not the dead. No one, not even Satan, is dead. He's, he's being helped in, in heaven by Michael. He, uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. Dolores from Tennessee. When we are delivered up before Satan for the Holy Spirit to speak through us, will we be in flesh bodies or spiritual bodies? We will be in flesh bodies. The spiritual bodies do not transpire until the seventh trump. The seventh trump is when the true Christ returns. The sixth trump is when the, the false Christ returns, and we are still in flesh bodies. But that's fine. You are well equipped. And Father says, don't even premeditate what you will say beforehand in Mark 13, but you will speak what the Holy Spirit gives you at that moment. Every Christian has a destiny and a real purpose when they understand that, um, that witness of Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21. Paula from Florida. Can Satan read Christian minds? No, he cannot. God is a heart knower. He knows your mind. He, you don't have to say it out loud. He knows what you're thinking. But Satan does not have that ability. But once you say it out loud, if you're one of his elect, he can hear it. And I mean, he can get to work on you over time. If you're not real careful, if you don't use the power to drive him away from you, if you don't use the power to even make him afraid of you, then he can interrupt your plans quite easily. So that's why if you have something you got going that's real critical, Sometimes it's best not to say it out loud until you got it sewed up. Beryl from California. Did Adam have two wives? Absolutely not. Now, mythology would have it because it tries to explain the six-day creation of all the races. They bring a, a character called Lilith, who was a sexual goddess, into the equation. She doesn't exist never existed, and it's all mythology. <clears throat> but, you know, there are scholars, I don't know of anyone else that teaches the six-day creation, but I assure you there are Hebrew scholars that know that it's correct, because I have received letters from them asking me to stop because people will call me a racist. 
Well, I haven't stopped and I have no intentions of it because it does not make you a racist to look at God's beautiful creation. And after the races were created, as it is written in the last verse of chapter 1, Genesis, God looked and it was good. He liked it. Uh, Regina from uh, Virginia, <clears throat> my question, will the New Jerusalem come down before or after the millennium? Uh, absolutely uh, after. Until um, the end of the millennium, the earth is not changed. The terra firma, the arets, whatever you want to call it, does not change until after the millennium. Quite frankly, it is not put back to its original shape, but I shouldn't say shape, condition, until bad people are destroyed, blotted out in the lake of fire. Then and then only does the whole new creation rejuvenated back to its original form come into being. It is absolutely precious, it is beautiful, and it will be a wonderful world. Buttercups all the way to the North Pole. Uh, John from West Virginia. Uh, thank you, our staff, and appreciate that. I have a question I want to ask. I've been wondering for a long time. Do you know which of the disciples it is where it says whom Jesus loved? Could that have been Mark John? No, it was not Mark John. It was, it was St. John, okay? John the disciple. Did the same John write St. John's epistles? Yes, he did, and the book of Revelation. Uh, but it was not Mark John. Uh, Mark John is called Mark in the gospel most often. Sharon from North Carolina, could you tell me what the last day means? I'm not well, so I hope you read this. Thank you. Well, it, I can read it real well. The last days are the days just prior to the Lord's day. We are in the last days, the t days described that lead up to the Lord's day. We know that because of the parable of the fig tree. It began in 1948 when Israel became a nation again. Both the good and the bad fig were set out there. Uh, Linda from, I don't know where Linda's from. Uh, I enjoy watching your program. Okay, I have two questions. Was Joseph married before he met Mary? No, he was not. Where was Moses buried? Uh, nobody knows. Even Satan uh, would like to find out where his bones are. But uh, Book of Jude. I've, I've re but read the last chapter of the great book of Deuteronomy. God would not let man bury Moses. God himself took Moses. And this is the reason on the Mount of Transfiguration Elijah, who did not die, and no man buried, and Moses, whom no man buried, appeared with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. So that pretty well answers your question, if you think about it right real good. Peggy from Texas, could you explain the difference between the elect and the very elect? Well, it's take like the Stuart that God gave ten pence for one and five for another. And he expected more out of the one he gave ten. And sure enough, the one with ten brought back another ten. And five the same way. And he, said he treated them both exactly the same. Because you see, whom God gives much, he expects much whom God gives much, the very elect, they're not any better than the elect because God is the giver. But I guarantee you, whom he gives much, he expects production. He expects fruit. And it had better thee well be there. Otherwise, you would be like the little guy, the steward, that he only gave one pence, and he took it and he held it and he buried it. Okay. He didn't share it. In other words, always share truth and that that God would use you in. Uh, Floyd from Michigan, 
when we are delivered up and the Holy Spirit talks for us, did I just do I just keep my mouth shut and listen? That's what you do. You don't premeditate what you're going to say. You let him do the talking. Were those who lived to be 900 years old, did they have flesh bodies? Of course they did. Methuselah will use him. Uh, why? There was no pollution. We poison ourselves today, whether for, through chemicals and what have you. But back then, it was all pure. But it didn't take man long to mess it up. Uh, this would be Evelyn from Mississippi, age 10. When the end of the world comes, the animals that are still down here, will God bring them to heaven also? Well, hon, read Isaiah chapter 11. Read about those beautiful animals that are right there with us. And even the carnivores themselves are no longer carnivores. And even the serpent himself, uh, the actual snake, now not not Satan, the serpent, they're not poisonous anymore. And, uh, and, and uh, why? Pro well, are they in spirit bodies also? Uh, that's, there's been a big change, and yes, that's probably so. Isaiah chapter 11. Diana from Alabama. I love to listen to you teach. Some days I listen to you all d day. That's, you like to study, don't you? Could you tell me where it's at where the lion will lay down with the lamb? The calf will lay down with the lamb. Same place, uh, Isaiah chapter 11. Barbara from Oregon. I have a question. I hope you can help me. How do you know what your gift from God is? I hope you can help. Thank you. Well, Barbara, it's real simple. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, and you know the false Christ is coming first, your gift is to witness against him. Your gift is to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, as Mark 13 says. What a, you know, even the prophets wanted to live at this time. What a fantastic time to live in this generation and, and to be able to serve God and to love him and to, and to love the brethren and to be on guard uh, naturally. Uh, Deborah from Pennsylvania. Pastor Murray, is the name of Jesus actually mentioned in the Old Testament like Emmanuel, God with us, so that non-believers that read only the Old Testament could be showing Jesus in the Old Testament? What does Jesus mean? Jesus, Yeshua is Yahweh's Savior. The whole book of Hosea is about him. Hosea is part of Yeshua. Okay. Hosea means saved. And God is going about his people, lo my lo ami, and, and well, I'm here, I'm speaking, my people and not my people. They are his people when they love the Lord Jesus Christ, which is, you quoted it here, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. What does it say? A virgin shall conceive and shall bear a child, and you shall name him Emmanuel, being interpreted is God with us. And, and so it is. Also in the great book of Deuteronomy, it is stated uh, that I will raise up among you one of your own that, um, that will lead you and direct you. And then naturally in Isaiah, I'm sorry, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, he would come in, enter Jerusalem, riding lowly upon the colt of an ass. That was the first advent. The 10th verse of chapter 9, Zechariah, a stallion, he comes in, a steed, a war horse. And that's the second advent, and he comes in conquering and to conquer. And then go on to the 14th chapter of, of uh, Zechariah, and you have Christ's feet touching down on the Mount of Olives and splitting away all the way to the east gate, away for departure. That's, that's all Old Testament. As a matter of fact, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the first prophecy of the Bible is about Jesus Christ concerning the serpent seed. Oh, oh dear goodness, he mentioned the serpent seed doctrine. No, God did. I just quoted it for you. Genesis 3, 15. God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thy seed, that's the serpent seed, and the woman's seed. You're going to bruise his heel. You're going to nail him to the cross, but he is going to bust your head. 
Okay. Okay, Charles from Arizona. I hope you will answer my question, please. Are the Kenites mixed in every race, including the white race? Well, who was their mother? Their mother was Eve. What does Adam mean in the Hebrew tongue? It means ruddy complected, white, in other words. So naturally, uh, uh, he started out that way, and, and the Kenites have intermixed. It is well with them that they intermix with all people for control. Uh, Peter from North Carolina, Pastor Murray, thank you, you're, thank, you're welcome. Do you think, as in the great book of Acts, our Father will send forth an angel to us just prior to our being delivered up to comfort us and give us good cheer? Well, don't be shaken too bad, okay? You know, look forward to it, a time to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need, uh, I mean, the Holy Spirit is coming himself to comfort you. It doesn't get any better than that. Why would you want an angel when Christ is coming to you? That's what the who the Holy Spirit is. I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you for it. You know? It, it, hey, it makes his day. And when you make his day reading the letter he's sent to you, you, then He's going to make your day because you made his. Don't ever forget that. Bless God. He will always bless you. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Now, most important, though, I want you to listen and listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Epistles of John, three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with, my little children, or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love and we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. After these words of encouragement, John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to this family Bible study hour. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Ready to get back into our Father's Word. We're doing subjects, and the subject that we will complete today is a lecture started yesterday or in the last uh, uh, showing, Objects of Worship. And we had discussed superstitions, how superstitious some people can be. Uh, man burn up $10 worth of car rubber, rubber tires.